Hey everyone, welcome to our Facebook Live. It's been a little while. Um, I'm Craig Wagner, legal counsel for the Utah Association of Realtors, and uh, I have Lance Harrison, also legal counsel. Uh, thanks for joining us, Lance. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, it's um, it's always great to, to to get out and teach and to to talk about some things that are going on on the hotline. Um, Lance and I both have had some questions as of late uh, dealing with the UAR appraisal addendum, so we definitely want to talk about that. Uh, we do want to talk about some other issues dealing with appraisals, but like uh, like we've done in in frankly years past, if you if you have any questions out there uh, related to the topic or frankly unrelated, uh, feel free to to chat with us and go ahead and type those in and we'll, we'll definitely um, have that discussion with you and, and try to answer your questions. But what I wanna do first, Lance, uh, the UAR appraisal addendum. Many of you have seen it. You've, you probably have seen it in offers. It's been in existence for almost a year now. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna highlight this, this addendum and, and how to fill it out and just make it as, as simple as possible in going through this. So let's start first, this appraisal addendum, Lance, why would a, let's start with a buyer, why would a buyer want to include this appraisal addendum as part of their offer, potentially? Yeah, so if a buyer is going to add this, a lot of times it can make their offer look uh, quite strong, right? It can, it can strengthen their offer. And it says, look, even if it comes in a little lower, up to you know a certain amount, we're going to bring cash to the table. So it's, it's really just a, a way to strengthen an offer, I think, for a buyer. Yeah, and and really the the genesis of this form that came into existence um, last year was sorry, someone's trying to call me. Uh, th really, this this uh, this form came into genesis because there were a lot of creative offers out there. Uh, dealing with appraisal and buyers saying, look, I'm willing to pay X number of dollars above the appraised value. And then there were some questions of, well, did that language change the purchase price? Did it not? And, and we really wanted to try to avoid that fight altogether, that, that potential ambiguity down the road. So let's go through this contract. Let's go through the, the buyer's appraisal addendum. Uh, and so let's look at it. So you have this buyer's appraisal clause right? And so let's look first at 1A and that's, let's just read it because I've had people say, well, it's too complicated. Let's, let's make it as simple as possible. Let's read through this uh, together, Lance, and then we can talk about what it means. So 1A, appraisal guarantee. In the event the property appraises for less than the purchase price, but more than blank, so you would have to fill in something there and that would be the appraisal floor, Buyer agrees that the purchase price sh shall not be reduced and buyers shall pay the difference between the appraised value and the purchase price in cash at settlement. And it also says the terms of this paragraph amend section 8.2 of the REPC. So, so Lance, let's, let's, uh, let's say the purchase price is $500,000 and I want to indicate that I'm willing to make up uh, $25,000 above the appraised value. What number should be my appraisal floor in 1A? Well, you're, you're asking me to do quick math, Craig, but I think- I am. <laughs> you know, so if you're, if you're willing to bring 25 grand to the table, right? Then that number, the appraisal floor should be 25 grand below your purchase price, right? Because I think something- if, if we slow down and read it, it's, it's not a complicated form, but we have to slow down and, and see what it's actually saying, because I think a lot of people want to do something else a lot of times. Whatever else that is, they want to do something else, but, and so it gets confusing when they try to do that or try to amend it, or they just fill in the blank without reading it very, very carefully. So yeah, if you want to bring cash and you want to strengthen your offer that way, 25 grand, you want to do 475 is the appraisal floor, which means... If the appraisal comes between 475 and 500, nothing changes in the price. Price is always the same, but you're going to be bringing cash to make up that difference. Yeah, the, the, and the forms committee, they, there really are a number of ways this, this form could have been drafted. 
and, and we want to start with the premise that when a buyer and seller agree to this form, the purchase price stays the same, no matter what, right? And so in, in Lance's scenario, you know, if the appraisal comes in between that gap, between $500,000 and four seventy-five, dollars buyer's going to make up the difference. They're, they're saying ahead of time, I am going to make up the difference, right? And, th and that makes their offer look pretty strong, right? To a, to a seller that sees that and says, look, the purchase price is guaranteed, um, but the buyer's willing to, to, to make up the difference in this instance. That, that's a strong offer. Now, what happens, Lance, if the appraisal comes below the appraisal floor? So in, in our example, let's say the appraisal comes in at 450 when the appraisal floor was 475. Uh, what do we do next? And how do the two parties navigate that scenario? Yeah, great question. So if we go down to the next section, right? B, buyer's right to cancel. It's going to give us when the buyer can back out, right? If the appraised value is less than the appraisal floor. So if it comes in at 450, the appraisal floor is 475, purchase price is 500 then this is where it's going to fit in, right? If the appraised value is less than the appraisal floor, then buyers shall have the right to cancel the REPSI in accordance with the terms of 8.2a of the REPSI, which is normal. That's just the normal. Nothing really changes. It just means they have the right to cancel just as they normally do under the appraisal section. So you've just kind of amended it so that the appraisal condition is only applicable below the, the appraisal floor. Yeah, exactly. Purchase price doesn't change. It, it, the buyer certainly doesn't have to cancel. They could say, well, yeah, I'm willing to make up all the difference. Great. I mean, they're still under contract. Uh, they could certainly propose a price adjustment based on the, the lower than expected appraised value. But certainly the seller doesn't have to agree to that, right? It's just a negotiation. And, and certainly if the seller doesn't agree to that price modification, and the buyer wants to cancel, as long as they've checked under 8.2a, which is the appraisal condition, buyer would have a right to cancel up until that financing and appraisal deadline. If they pass that deadline, then they've waived their, their right to cancel. They've, they've waived that condition of purchase. Yeah, and, so, and, and this form is kind of drafted so with the understanding that there is an appraisal condition, right? So, so if you don't have an appraisal condition, that's going to change things, right? Because this is already kind of implying that, yes, we're assuming that you have checked that there's an appraisal condition. Yeah, it's, it's simply modifying that condition where it's still preserving a right to cancel, but only if the appraisal comes below the appraisal floor. Uh, if it comes in above the appraisal floor, then the buyer's not going to have a right to cancel based on a low appraisal. So it's just changing section 8.2. So we, we, again, we wanted to make this as simple as possible. Certainly we could have drafted versions that change the purchase price based on a triggering event, like a lower, lower appraisal, but, but we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. And so it's, it's really meant to allow a buyer to indicate that they're a strong buyer and it allows a seller to, to keep the purchase price the exact same as it was when they went under contract uh, initially. But again, they're free to, to negotiate. Now, yeah. oh, oh, sorry. Ahead, Lance. I was just oh. going to say, maybe we should talk about section C too. <laughs> that was, that, you read my mind, Lance. That's, that's right where I was going. Uh, so you look at 1A, 1B, pretty simple when we read it, right? When we go through, what does it do? Pretty simple. Now, 1C is blank. These are additional terms. Um, Lance, what problems have you seen on the hotline dealing with section 1C of this addendum? Yeah, so people put all sorts of things in, in 1C. And I think the problem that arises is when they're really trying to amend 1A somehow. Um, and, and it could be anything maybe they want to make, um, maybe they're trying to change the purchase price. Right? They actually want the purchase price to be changed. So they're filling this form out. And then in additional terms, they say something about the purchase price being changed. Th that is just a weird thing to do because you shouldn't be using this form if that's what you want to do. Additional terms, I think, is, is a good place for 
unrelated things that you want to add that you don't want to have another addendum. If you want to change the appraisal guarantee, it might be best to just use a blank addendum because it gets really confusing when you have language in 1A that's conflicting with 1C. Um, it just gets hard to understand what the parties are really agreeing to. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that, that information about 1C because I've seen the same thing. If you're trying to change 1A or 1B, just use your own addendum, use a blank addendum and, and try to make it as clear as possible. 1C would be a, a great example to, to use closing costs. Or for a seller, if they're countering with this form, they could certainly counter this and maybe they wanna change a deadline or they wanna change earnest money or they wanna change anything else about the buyer's offer. That's where 1C would make it so that you only have to use one addendum, great? I mean, that, that's really the, the premise behind it. It's 1C is not meant to modify 1A or 1B, okay? I, I just wanna make that as, as clear as possible. It's meant for other unrelated terms like Lance said. And so that'll, that'll avoid any sort of ambiguity in your contract down the road. Any other thoughts or, or concerns or, or clarification points dealing with this addendum, Lance? Um, yeah, I would just make sure that your clients understand and that you communicate clearly what, what are you trying to do, right? And then make sure that this form fits what you're trying to do. And if it doesn't, it might be better to use a different form or a blank form. And if you're going to do that, I would just be very careful because drafting your own language is, it's difficult. It's difficult for everybody to make clear um, language. So that's just, that's just my warning, of course, is, is use the right form. But if it's not the right form, don't try to create it into the right form by forcing some, some weird language. Yeah. And maybe the, the last thing that I'll say about this addendum, um, under 1C, I've seen people use escalation clause language. That can get somewhat confusing where you're talking about a purchase price, but then you're talking about a purchase price that may change based on other competing offers. And then you're talking about an appraisal guarantee. It, again, you just wanna make it as clear as possible so, so that there's only one interpretation for your contractual language. If there are dual interpretations or more than two interpretations, then your, then your language is ambiguous. And that could be a breach of fiduciary duty of reasonable care and diligence and could potentially um, make it difficult for your client, either the buyer or the seller. Yeah, and that's a responsibility for both agents, right? It, both agents need to be reading that. You don't, don't accept it if you don't think it's that clear, right? Don't think, oh, we're on the same page. You know, you wanna make sure that the language itself is clear, not that you just both think that you understand what the language says. Yeah. Yeah. So we hope that, that that clarifies the appraisal addendum. I would encourage uh, brokers to go over that in, in their sales meetings. Uh, even if you don't use the UAR addendum, which you absolutely do not have to do, it may be a good point of emphasis to say, okay, with our appraisal language, how can we make our language more clear so that it's clear to a buyer and a seller? What exactly are they agreeing to? So hopefully that's that's helpful. <laughs> Maybe the, the last thing, and I'm looking to see if we have any questions. I don't, I don't see any right now. The, maybe the last thing that I, I want to cover dealing with appraisals and the appraisal condition is that I'm, I'm hearing on the hotline a decent number of offers being accepted where there's a due diligence condition, there's a financing condition, but then the appraisal condition is being waived, meaning there's not a right to cancel based on a lower than purchase price appraised value. And so Lance, the question that I'm kind of getting on the hotline is, well, if a, if a buyer's waived their appraisal condition, does a buyer still have a right to do an appraisal on the property? Yeah, and that's a great question. I've had that question a lot and, and there's a couple of ways to approach it, but generally I'm gonna say, let's look at due diligence, right? Are you, what are you allowed to do under due diligence for sure? It's very broad. You can do basically any kind of test or evaluation or anything you want during due diligence. So could appraisal fall under due diligence? Yeah, I think it probably could. You go past your due diligence, do you still have a right? I think there's good arguments that you probably have a right, but it's not a bad idea if you're gonna waive due diligence say, and we've reserved the right to do it. You know, you can add language to make sure that you still have those rights. 
Um, but yeah, I, I generally say you probably do. Yeah, so, so if you look at section 8.1, it talks about, yeah, buyer can do any tests and evaluations of the property. And certainly if they wanna evaluate the, the value of the property, um, sure, I, I would say due diligence allows for that. If they've waived the appraisal condition, man, it, it's making it, it's making it clear to a buy, to a seller that it's not a condition of purchase. And so I, I agree with you that if you want to preserve that right to do an appraisal on the property, you, you should probably explicitly say so and, and make it clear. Now, I would say most sellers are, are willing to agree to something like that, but there is that argument that, well, where can a buyer point to a provision in the contract that allows them to do an appraisal within the property after due diligence, um, and especially if the appraisal condition is waived? And so to avoid that fight, which again, most transactions, there's not going to be an issue, but certainly they, they need to have um, that dialogue. Uh, it looks like there is a question. Uh, does the seller have to allow any more inspections of the property after the due diligence deadline? And I, I think that's a, that's a good question. The only other time that I'm aware of where a seller agrees contractually to allow the buyer to, to walk through the property is, Lance, do you know? Uh, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> I tried to give you a hint when I said oh, walk. Through. Yeah, walk through. <laughs> Final walk through section. So section eleven is where it talks about that, and it does talk about that would be you know no no later no no earlier than seven days uh, calendar days prior to the settlement deadline. Outside of that, I mean, due diligence is the time for a buyer to do inspections if they want to preserve the right to do inspections after due diligence. That that really should be spelled out explicitly within the contract and, and agreed to by both the buyer and the seller. Um, so I, I guess the, the answer to that question would be really the contract needs to say so in order for the buyer to continue to have inspections of the property. And frankly, we could even go a step further. If you're waiving due diligence, then you probably want to preserve a right to inspect the property, again, within the contract. Because under section 8.1, it talks about how that section only applies if it's a condition or purchase, meaning the seller's obligation to cooperate, the buyer's ability to do any tests and evaluations, it's tied to that condition of purchase. Again, most sellers are okay with that, but I would spell it out just as, as a way to fulfill your fiduciary duty and to set clear expectations for both the buyer and the seller. Yeah, and I, I love that, Craig, because I think... A, a, Normally, yeah, a seller is probably going to allow those things, even though the contract doesn't specifically say it. But a lot of sellers might be accepting that that waiver that waiver of due diligence because they think, great, that's a really strong offer. They're not even going to look at it. They're just going to bring that purchase price. That's that's a reason why the seller is relying in, and accepting that offer. So to come back later, if you don't know, that's a pretty risky if you, to to just assume. That you still have the right to do those things and not explicitly uh, line those yeah. out. Okay, it looks like another question. So, if all inspections and conditions or contingencies are waived, is the earn, earnest money already lost from the buyer? And I, and I think the impetus of that question is: Is the earnest money non-refundable upon acceptance if there's no condition of purchase, meaning there's no due diligence, there's no financing, there's no appraisal? Is the earnest money non-refundable at that point? What do you think, Lance? It's a good question. I, I've thought about this too, and you can tell me what you think, but earnest money to me is, it's kind of naturally non-refundable. And then the, the contract lays out when you potentially could get it back. So if you're waiving everywhere where the contract says you can get your earnest money back, then yeah, it's probably non-refundable. Now, of course, there's section 16, right? That says that's another place that you can get earnest money back. And that's so is that a refund? I don't know, but is it a, it's a breach and it tells you when you can get it back. But if you're waiving things that says you can get it back, then you should look for ways to get it back. And there's not many of them. There's, there's none really except for section 16, um, maybe a few other places, but yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and I really like that, Lance. The 
earnest money, sometimes we think of earnest money as simply a protection for the seller, right? We think, oh, earnest money ensures the buyer is going to perform their end of the bargain. But if earnest money is, is neutral, it is a protection for both the buyer and the seller. So, so if the seller fails to meet their contractual obligations, earnest money is a way to, to uh, ensure that performance under section 16.2, the seller default section. So, so yes, earnest money um, may become non-refundable, but I wouldn't say that it, it's automatically lost simply because there's no conditions because they're, it, it's still ensuring the, the performance of the seller to perform their contractual obligations. Yeah, and I think we've had a lot of examples of really high earnest monies, right? And it and it we don't know exactly the details of those deals, but I hope that the agents are explaining the risk on both sides, right? For the buyer and the seller. It's not just, oh, that's a huge amount. That's a great incentive to the seller. It's also a, a risk. So yeah. Well, that those are all those are the, some of the, the pressing issues that I could see, just some reoccurring questions over the past year dealing with appraisal, certainly earnest money issues we, we've seen and, and we, we try to address those. Um, the, the appraisal, it's, 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 a, it's a key component of the contract. I, I don't have to tell that to, to realtors. You understand that and appraisers are trying to assign value based on, on what comps or, or things that have gone have sold uh, in the past. And so they're kind of back looking, but forward look, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's complicated, right? And so we wanna try to help you navigate that. Some resources I would point you to, dealing with uh, appraisals and how to deal with appraisers is, is found on NAR's website. Just, just type in on NAR, you know, dealing with appraisers. And one of the first search terms that'll come up are NAR's frequently asked questions dealing with appraisers and how to navigate that and what communication can you have with the appraiser? Um, who's the client? I mean, oftentimes we think, oh, the client's the person paying for the appraisal. No, uh, the, the client is, is oftentimes the, the lender, right? Um, is oftentimes the lender. And so we just trying to navigate and, and getting those things correct. So hopefully we can, we can uh, have some more, but feel free to send us any topics that you want us to, to cover. The hotline, as, as usual, is open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8.30 to 4. Um, feel free to leave a message, and we, we'd love to take your calls. Till next time, take care. Bye.